So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, lecture. It's a discovery lecture, series lecture given by Chairman Rogers. Uh, there will be opportunity for questions afterwards, and there's two microphones, one on either aisle here. So if you could form an orderly line for questions at the end. Um, my name's Maureen McCann. I'm director of Purdue's Energy Center. We have 150 faculty affiliated with us, and of course, all of their undergraduate, graduate, and postdocs and technicians in their groups. So energy is really a, a signature area for us here at Purdue. And on that note, we're absolutely delighted that we could bring one of the thought leaders from energy, someone who has some very progressive ideas about the needs for sustainable energy for all on a global stage, and also the bringing on of renewable energies and energy efficiencies. So it's my pleasure actually to introduce Dr. Al Rebar, who's the, the Executive uh, Vice President for Research and um, Director of Discovery Park. Al? Thanks, Maureen. Through the Discovery Lecture Series, Purdue University welcomes noted speakers to campus every year. Speakers whose work uh, embodies the spirit of innovation, boldness, and interdisciplinary endeavor that we believe characterizes Discovery Park. As a part of this distinguished lecture series, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker. Jim Rogers is chairman of the board for Duke Energy, the largest energy utility company in the United States. He recently concluded an impressive 25-year tenure as chief executive officer in the energy util utility industry. Jim became president and CEO of Duke in 2006, following the merger between Duke Energy and Synergy. Before that merger, he served as Synergy's chairman and CEO for more than 11 years. Prior to the formation of Synergy, he joined Public Service Indiana Energy in 1988 as the company's chairman, president, and CEO. Throughout Jim's career, his companies have delivered exceptional shareholder return by focusing on sustainable growth and a forward-looking business strategy. Jim has long advocated for investing in energy efficiency, modernizing electric infrastructure, and pursuing advanced technologies and nuclear energy to grow the economy and transition to a low-carbon future. Under Jim's leadership, Duke Energy has been recognized as a national leader in energy delivery and sustainability, balancing the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. In 2010 and 2011, the company was named to the elite Dow Jones Sustainability World Index, and it's been listed on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for North America for the past seven years. Jim also serves as a vice chairman of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. He's a founding member of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, and he served on the board of directors for eight Fortune 500 companies and is currently a director of Cigna Corporation and Applied Materials Incorporated, as well as a member of the Nature Conservancy's board of directors. Now, clearly, Jim has had a very distinguished managerial career. As an early advocate for balancing the interests of diverse st stakeholders, Jim's inclusive leadership approach was featured in Harvard Business Review. He's been recognized as an effective and accessible voice for business, earning the reputation as a CEO statesman. He's twice been named Energy Industry CEO of the Year, first in 2007 by Platts, a division of McGraw-Hill, and then again in 2010 by Energy Biz Magazine. Also among his many awards and recognitions, Jim was named one of the 50 most powerful people in the world in 2009 by Newsweek Magazine. Through his professional career and personal vision, Jim Rogers embodies a commitment to discovery and the pursuit of excellence at the frontier of innovation. He's shown a courageous willingness to lead people and industries into new areas of operation and new ways of thinking. Jim has an adventurous spirit of exploration rooted in the tradition and values of American capitalism. And he continues to lead his industry, and in fact, our international dialogue, in addressing ways to deliver energy systems to all people all across the world. 
In recognition of Jim's extraordinary contributions to his industry, I'm very pleased to announce that Purdue University's Discovery Park today honors Jim Rogers for his 25 years of visionary leadership as an energy industry CEO with our inaugural Innovation Achievement Award, which you can see here. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Rogers to the podium. Good afternoon. Come on, let's be there. I'm here. First of all, I want to thank you all very much for being here today, and I want to thank Al for this recognition. Uh, it's really terrific. I really appreciate it. And um, it's always great to be back at Purdue. In fact, I've been at Purdue so many times over the last four months that I have the fear that President Daniels is going to start charging me tuition. <laughs> Maybe I should apply for a scholarship. But let me, if I may, describe what a wonderful and day that I've had today leading up to this conversation. I had an opportunity to go to the new Herrick Labs. I had a great conversation over lunch about Discovery Park and what they are achieving. Then we, I had a robust discussion with a group of professors focused on smart grids, cyber, electrical developments, and the challenges of the future in our industry. And then I had a great discussion about STEM programs, including the SLED program that's really been led by Purdue. So let me, if I may, say that what's important to me today is to have a conversation with you and to continue the conversations I've had all day here at Purdue. And so my goal line is to talk for 20 minutes. That's almost impossible for me. Uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and then I want to use the majority of our time to really answer your questions, because I think it's very important to have an interaction between uh, y'all and me. And, and by the way, when that time comes, I am prepared to talk about anything you want to talk about. I'll talk about the Sox game last night. I'll talk about anything, including my role as a leader in this industry. Now, which, let, let me quickly do a couple things. First, in terms of the power sector, I want to start there and I want to do a quick look back to 130 years ago when we got started. It was really a group of entrepreneurs coming together to try to find a way to provide electricity to people in America. And during that period, we were considered the high-tech industry of the day. Given the challenges we have in front of us, we're going to reinvent ourselves and become the high-tech industry of tomorrow. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But as you look back at this history, our only product when we went into business was lighting. Who would have guessed, who would have imagined at that time that because of electricity, we would enable refrigeration, uh, x-rays, MRIs, laser surgery, radios, TV, uh, the internet, computers, cell phones. All of that's possible today because of electricity. So it's become the great enabler. And in fact, in the 20th century, when they looked at all the engineering achievements, and Neil Armstrong, who once served on my board and is a graduate of Purdue, saw a statue out there, pretty good likeness. Uh, but, but the reality is he chaired this committee of the National Academy of Engineers, and they found that the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century was not putting a man on the moon. It was not computers. It was not the auto industry, it, it was not the internet, but it was actually the electrification of America. 
because it, at the end of the day, enabled all these other things to happen. But that's about the past. Let me talk about the future, and I'm going to talk about the future in the context of challenges. We provide electricity. Um, I guess the best way to say it is this. Our mission is to provide affordable, reliable, increasingly clean electricity 24-7, 365 days a year. That's our mission. The toughest part about our job is getting the balance right between affordability, reliability, and clean. Because sometimes you have to make trade-offs, and that's very difficult. Much of our focus in the 20th century was on affordability. The other important thing to know as we get into this conversation today is there is no perfect fuel. The other thing to know is that one of the strengths of our system is that we have a portfolio of ways to make electricity. We have coal, which is our predominant way of generating electricity in Indiana. We have natural gas. We have nuclear. We have renewables. And we have energy efficiency. I think of it as a fuel because, quite frankly, if you can reduce usages of electricity, the most environmentally benign plant you will ever build will be the one that you don't have to build. So we have these multiple ways to generate electricity. That gives us great strength. And none of those are perfect. Some are cheap. Some are expensive. Some are dirty. Some are very clean. And so the reality is, how do you get that mix right? That, that leads me to the challenges that we have. One of our great advantages and challenges is the discovery of shale gas. In my judgment, that is the greatest technological innovation of the last several decades. Why is it so significant? It's allowed the United States to become the largest producer of oil and gas. But it's done another thing. It is translated for our sector in producing electricity at a lower price, but also with a lower emissions footprint. And that's a break in the a paradigm that exists. The paradigm has always been, if it's going to be cleaner, it's got to be more expensive. Now we're showing that it can be cleaner and cheaper. So shale gas has played a great Role. We built five combined cycle plants to take advantage of it. We're dispatching it before we do our coal. We're dispatching it right after our hydro, then our nuclear. So it is a very valuable fuel to us. But what's the challenge? The challenge is, is we'll build all gas all the time and eliminate the portfolio that we have. As I look forward for Duke Energy, and this is pretty close to the way the industry will look. By 2015, we'll produce electricity about one-third from coal, one-third from gas, and wood one-third from nuclear and renewables. And that's by the 2015, and those are kind of rough approximations, and our entire country is moving that direction. So one of our challenges is when do we build nuclear? And by the way, if you're serious about climate, you need to be serious about nuclear. It is the only technology you have that you can produce electricity 24-7 with zero greenhouse gases. So it plays a very important role in us decarbonizing our economy as we go forward. So, so shale gas is an important opportunity and challenge for us as we try to maintain the portfolio. One reason why you want a portfolio is because you don't know what new technologies will come along to allow you to use coal and gas in a cleaner fashion. You don't know what new technologies in nuclear. You can already see advances being made in China off the AP-1000 as they've created a new technology, the CAP-1400, that will be even more advanced than the AP-1000. 
And with respect to renewables, the cost of solar has come down like this. The cost of wind has come down like this. And I shouldn't be moving like that. <laughs> tie this right. I can't talk if you tie my arms to my side. But the point here is there's a continuous change in innovation in the ability to use each of these fuels, and we need to keep them all in the equation. The other challenges we have, and, and in some senses the word is great news for our customers, and that's this. The productivity gains in the use of electricity are really increasing. Today, in the average home, there are 25 devices that use electricity. And the amazing thing is, is that, I have to do it with my left hand, um, the amazing thing is that per residential use is starting to decline. That's because of more efficient appliances, more efficient buildings, more efficient cell phones and iPads. So there's been huge gains in productivity use of electricity um, in a lot of different devices that we use today to power our economy. So, the, so the, that is a challenge for us because our model in the 20th century was building on ever-increasing demand. In the 60s, it was 5%, then it went to 3% and 1%, and today it's pretty flat. And so when you're always growing, you can always invest and expand and modernize. Now we're at a place with an aging infrastructure where we're going to have to retire and replace every power plant by 2050, where we're going to have to modernize our grid to move it from analog to digital to protect ourselves and make the grid more resilient so we can produce electricity at a greater than we do today, which is 99.99% of the time. But to do all that, we have the same customer base and the same amount of sales, and that means prices are going to go up. And yet the real price of electricity today is the same as it was 30 years ago. So we've done a great job of keeping the price down in real terms. The challenge is going to be keeping the price down in a period where there's no load growth. And that is going to be a huge challenge for us as we go forward. The last challenge that I will comment on is really the challenge of technology. Well, I talked about productivity gains in the use of electricity. There are huge productivity gains in the generation of electricity, the transmission and the distribution. And I talked to people today and there's even more technologies coming on, new ideas being developed. And at the end of the day, we're gonna totally rebuild and modernize. And that's why when I said earlier that we'll be the high tech company of tomorrow, I believe the provision of electricity will be that. Because our role will go from just not be, from just being a supplier, but also an optimizer of the use of electricity all the way from the generation to the solar panels on the rooftop to the devices within the home. So we need a broad concept to think about optimization. That is really very important role for us. But the question really is, how do you get paid for being an optimizer? It was pretty easy when you were getting paid for every incremental kilowatt hour you sold. So our challenge is to get the business model right, get the regulatory model right, and get prepared to be a leader on the deployment of technologies in the 21st century. Now, what I'd like to do is briefly turn to another challenge that faces the world. And that's the challenge of the 1.2 billion, that's with a B, billion people that have no access to electricity. I mean, think about that. That's almost four times the number of people that in our country don't have the ability to throw the switch in the morning, don't have the ability uh, to turn the lights on, don't have the ability to plug in and charge their cell phones. So as I look out to the future, coming up with technologies and the ability, different technologies, 
in order to provide universal access to sustainable energy for all is going to be one of the great challenges of this century. And they deserve it. And quite frankly, access to electricity has a catalytic impact on economic development. Without it, you can't have sustainable clean water. Without it, you can't have the proper ability to cook in a way uh, every day that doesn't create, anytime you use kerosene or wood or dung to cook, that's not a good thing. And that has a lot of health implications when you do that. So to have a 21st century access to electricity is really critical for the 1.2 billion people. They're predominantly in Africa, India, Indonesia, some in Latin America, but the reality is we need to go to work and find a way to bring electricity to these people. I think we can do it with solar technologies, emerging battery technologies, uh, as well as microgrids. And in a sense, as we go to a village and we install a microgrid, what that really allows people to do is you hook the battery up, you hook the, the, um, the solar up, and it provides electricity. But the advantage for us in the developed world is it gives us, allows us to accelerate our understanding and development of microgrids. Because I believe, because of the threat of cyber attack, terrorist attack on our systems, and just the routine storms that we are increasingly dealing with, that that will make our system more resilient to be able to build microgrids. Now you go, well, what's a microgrid? Well, a microgrid really allows you to island your facility. An easy way to think about it is if there is a storm that goes through West Lafayette and the lights have gone out, if you've islanded the hospital, the lights will stay on even with a storm sweeping through. And, this, and the same thing applies when you think of a cyber attack. They can attack a system, it could take the lights out, but you could island key facilities. And I should say the Department of Defense, this is one of the missions they have, is the ability to mi create microgrids around every defense facility they have, not just outside the United States, but around the world. So this mission is something that I'm seriously thinking about doing. I've been studying it. And one of the things as I study it that I've learned, that there is roughly 3 billion people in the world that are underserved. They only have electricity eight hours or 12 hours or 16 hours. They don't have it 24 seven the way we do in the developed world. So one of our challenges is not only to hook up the 1.2, but to provide 24 seven service to those that don't have complete service around the clock. Two different challenges, uh, two different um, models that need to be developed to allow that to happen. And I've been to Africa and I've been to the villages and I've seen firsthand the situations. And I guess the one thing that I would say, I was in Kenya and I was in a village and I saw someone with a cell phone. I go, cool. Um, I didn't speak Swahili, I might add, but someone translated for me. And I said, well, how do you charge it? I don't see any electricity. He says, I walk three hours when I need to charge my cell phone. And that really got me thinking about that. Uh, not a great use of his time. But the more important thing is, it occurred to me, is there a way to solve that problem? And what I discovered is there's a company in Australia that makes solar lanterns that allow you to charge your cell phone. And our company working with 13 other major utilities in the world have put together a program and have deployed over 50,000 solar lanterns in remote villages to allow them to have access to electricity because in Africa, 70, even though they don't have access to electricity, 70% of the people have cell phones. 
So they need the capability to charge it. And the solar lantern is a primitive first step. Microgrids come next. But at the end of the day, that really gives them an opportunity to access the modern world. Now, before I open it up to questions, I want to share one other story with you. You know, in our country, and actually around the world, we basically are focused on the short term, uh, tomorrow. Uh, in, the, in the business world, what are your earnings going to be the next quarter, in the, or the next year? We really need to embrace long-term thinking. You need to embrace long-term thinking as you think about your career. And as you think about the problems that our society faces, not just here in the United States, but societies around the world, it's important to have this long-term view. And what, the way I describe it is really as cathedral thinking. Now, why is cathedral thinking important? And our business is important because we build nuclear plants that last 60 years, or we build coal plants that last 40 years, or an infrastructure that lasts 30 years. So we take a very long view. But it's very important for our societies and for you to have that thinking um, as you think about what goes on in the country and what the important issues are. To me, cathedral thinking works like this. I should tell you how I ended up with the idea. I took one of my granddaughters when she turned 10 to London and then to Paris. I'm not going to tell you how that happened because that's a much longer story. But the bottom line is I thought my granddaughter was going to be born on my 50th birthday, and she wasn't. And my oldest daughter basically, I, I talked to her before I went to see her, and she said, um, I said, you know, it'd be worth a lot to that girl if you just kind of hang in there till tomorrow morning. Uh, as it turns out, she had that baby two hours before my 50th birthday. So I went in the hospital when I got to Texas. I went in, I gave my daughter a kiss, I congratulated her. And, I, and then I looked at her and I said, I thought we had a deal. <laughs> and she kind of looked at me and said, Dad, there's some things I can't control. And secondly, the more I thought about what you asked me to do, the more I said, no way, she's going to have her own birthday. And then finally, because she's the oldest daughter, what she said to me, she said, well, think of it this way. On London time, she was born on your birthday. <laughs> and I said, when she turns 10... We'll go to London and celebrate on the same day. It turns out she had already been to London. Grandfathers don't like to take their grandchildren to places they've already been, so I took her to Paris. But when I went to Paris, we saw Notre Dame, and we had a guide, and they shared the story of Notre Dame. And, and this is underpins cathedral thinking. When the architects built that, they never saw it completed. It took over 100 years, and in that period of time, that was four generations, three or four generations. And so the architect never saw it finished, although he designed it. The people that worked on the foundation their entire life, faithfully, every day, building the foundation, never saw the walls or the stained glass windows. Those that worked on the walls and the stained glass windows never saw the spires. And even though that saw it finished on that first day it was completed, never saw all the weddings, the funerals, the prayers, the thoughts of the people that celebrated within that cathedral. But they worked, spent their whole life dedicated to it. They worked hard. They had faith in what they were doing, and they, and they were following a vision. So while it's very true in industry, having a vision of where you want to take your company is important, it's equally important to have a vision with respect to your personal lives. And so cathedral thinking is kind of my shorthand way of saying, take the long view. Think about what I'm building 
not just for tomorrow, but for my children and grandchildren. Now look across the room, and none of y'all are worried about that yet, I'm betting, or hoping. Uh, but the reality is that is a very important way to think about business, to think about issues in our economy, and to think about relationships between countries around the world. So with that, let me stop and let's have a conversation. Okay, and by the way, I said it earlier, let me say it again. There is nothing you can ask me, almost nothing, uh, that I'm not prepared to take a shot at and try to answer. Yes, sir. Long term, in the future, what do you think the dominant energy source is? Whether, I know you said the near future is one third coal, one third gas, one third nuclear slash renewables. Is it one of those three, or do you think there'll be a new source that we don't see? I, I think that, did y'all hear that question? The question was what will be the dominant sources of electricity in future periods? I think it'll take us. 50 years or longer, we'll continue to use coal. I mean, look at the, the need for electricity in China as well as in India and Indonesia. So there's a huge need to keep building to provide electricity. There is also, um, so if you look out to 2050, we'll still be burning coal in the world. We'll be burning natural gas because it's cheaper uh, and, it, and it, in all likelihood, will still be cheaper given how we've reduced the cost of, of um, drilling for natural gas, particularly shale gas. Um, I think nuclear have to play a role. For it to play a role in the United States by 2050, we retire virtually all our nuclear plants between 2030-ish to about 2050. So we'll have to build all these new nuclear plants in order to maintain the nuclear fleet we have today. And 70% of our carbon-free electricity in America comes from nuclear. And so I think longer term, renewables and solar will play a bigger role, but their source is only variable. What makes their source more valuable is the development of new technologies. Our company is test, I mean, new batteries. Our company is testing seven different batteries on our system and trying to find a way forward. But I'm always reminded when I think about battery development of what Thomas Edison said in the 1890s. He said, battery technology will transform the power sector and its development is just around the corner. A hundred years later, we're still working on getting it around the corner. But I think we are close to pushing it across and that will transform the configuration of the grid. So the other thing that I think will be a trend is solar on the rooftop. I think you'll increasingly see that in areas where they have the right solar penetration to allow it to be uh, somewhat economic. Hi. Um, it's kind of, my question is uh, kind of uh, involved with what you just talked about with uh, nuclear power. You seem to uh, think that it is extremely prominent in the future and it has a bright future. Why do you think nuclear energy is the way to go? I think that nuclear technology is continuing to be developed. I believe it is the only way we can generate electricity 24-7 with zero greenhouse gases, because I think carbon is a major problem. I believe climate change is a problem that we need to address as a country, but we need to, it's a global problem, so we need everybody in the world to come together and address this problem. So I think nuclear play an important role, notwithstanding the decisions made in Germany, notwithstanding the decisions made in Italy, I think those will prove to be faulty decisions. I think the Chinese have got it right. They're building 25 new AP1000 units. They are already at work at modifying those units and developing new technologies. So I think that as the Chinese lead the world in solar panel production today and wind turbine, I think they'll lead the world in the production of nuclear power. And if you've seen any pictures lately of Beijing, they would be delighted to swap out those coal plants 
um, for nuclear plants where they can at least see their hand in front of themselves. The other important technology development that's on the horizon is what they call small modular reactors. And that work is going on, and there's four or five different technologies evolving. Um, and I believe that that will play a role as much as the huge central station type. Uh, I mean, if you think of it today on nuclear subs, nuclear subs today um, use nuclear to power them, and they work great. And so I think we will find a way. The key is to get the cost down to compete with other alternatives. But I think clean air will increasingly be a big issue in China. So they're going to change their mix because today they use 80% coal. I think in our country where we use 40% coal, I think nuclear will play a role because this climate issue is growing in significance and awareness of it and the recognition we need to do something about it is even greater today than it was just last year. Thank, Thank you. you. No. Yeah, over here. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Welcome to Purdue, Jim Rogers. I'm Sheila Klenker, state rep. Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you for coming to Purdue. I wanted to ask you about the nuclear waste. What we've heard through the United States for years is that there's no way to get rid of the nuclear waste, and there's always a fear uh, that something's going to happen as it happened at Chernobyl, in Russia, and other places. How well, do you see that being taken care of in the future? No, that's a wonderful question. Actually, the nuclear industry made a deal with our government for them to develop uh, a facility to allow us to store nuclear waste. In fact, we collected as an industry $30 billion from our customers so that our government could do that. And they had an obligation in 1998 to take that waste and store it. They had selected Yucca Mountain in Nevada as a perfect site to do it. And at the end of the day, they didn't honor their commitment to our industry and the people of this country by starting to take our nuclear waste to Yucca Mountain. And today, they're continuing to kick the can down the road like they do everything else. And so they need to step up and fulfill their responsibilities or they need to give the money back. Trust me, they can't afford to give the money back. Um, so I believe that... What we've had to do is move the nuclear fuel from our pools to cast system, which is a concrete cast system, and store it on site. And that's good for 75 years. We also need to look at, and this is where research is needed, in France, they have recycling units where they recycle it because 90% of the energy is still in the spent fuel rod. So if you think in terms of sustainability, you would build uh, the facility to recycle, which requires pulling the uranium and the plutonium apart and then reassembling. If we could, and the Fran French have done that, I've been to La Hague and stood on a site. I've stood on a site that's not much bigger than this, a little bigger, which had all the spent fuel for France for 40 years in that site because they had recycled the fuel, they had used it again, and then they stored it at that same facility. And they've done it safely for all these years. Now, there's technological advances that we could make in doing that, but I think that that is one solution. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, Yucca Mountain is perfectly fine. And so we either go down the route of uh, basically recycling, which I think is a more environmentally and uh, more economic thing to do, or we, we store it at Yucca Mountain. And so I feel very strongly that our government has let us down. They have not fulfilled their obligation, and, and we need now to take it in our hands and find a way to deal with it, separate from the government, but they need to give my money back. And I'm saying that on behalf of the customers. Uh, you kind of hit me in an area that I really feel not too passionately about. <laughs> yes. Hi, Mr. Rogers. Hi I'm there. a biology student from Purdue. Um, what I'm curious about is how biofuels can play a role in the future energy alternative of the uh, traditional coal or um, petroleum. 
I think biofuels will play an important role. Um, I'm actually working on a project with a Chinese company where we're taking, trying to measure the flue gas that comes out of our coal plants and how to use the carbon that comes out to accelerate the growth of algae and to convert it into a biofuel. So that's, there's a lot of work going on in how you accelerate the growth of algae to do that. Now, I believe in biofuels, but I don't really believe in using corn to create ethanol. Personally, I think that's a food versus fuel thing. It's driven up fuel call, I mean, food cost. And, and that is one, again, where Congress kind of missed the boat and put a subsidy in, and they won't take that subsidy out now. And I don't think that's a good use of corn. I think you can find other ways to generate ethanol uh, than just using corn. And in fact, we put a tariff on sugar ethanol from Brazil, and the tariff is a difference in the cost. It's about 54 cents a gallon, I think, not positive, 54, 57 cents a gallon. And sugar ethanol has eight times the energy content as corn. So it is more efficient and it's cheaper, but there's been, our government has blocked the import of this product. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Rogers. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. You must enjoy a trip to Indiana where you're not at the IURC on the stand. <laughs> Congratulations on that. I had a question for you with regard to uh, rooftop solar and your comments about uh, how obviously the price point has, has come down greatly, significantly in the past few years, but especially, and also that of wind. Uh, but more specifically with rooftop solar, can you expand a bit on Duke Energy's uh, thought process on how meter aggregation in terms of net metering at home, how, how you feel about, sure. about that? Thank you. That's a very good question because you're gonna see more and more solar on the rooftop. Um, and I, you see it across the country. I think the key is to get it right in terms of what do you pay for somebody that that produces solar and doesn't need it and, and puts it on the grid. Some people argue that it needs to be at the retail price, which includes our distribution and transmission and generation calls. Other people say that it should be at a wholesale price because all they're doing is selling it wholesale to the utility, which would be a much lower price. Or some say it should be at the average cost of our fuel. So there's a, two or three different ways to do it. And if, and if you're putting solar on the rooftop, you want the highest price, right? But, but at the end of the day, the highest price is not a fair price for the remaining customers on the system. Here's the phenomenon that's happening in California. In California, they've had a lot more experience with solar on the roof. By the way, there's a little more sun in Cal California than here. Uh, um, and so it, you get a better production of solar energy. But in California, the way they've done it, they've created what is kind of a term called lost revenues. And that lost revenues for the utility gets from having solar on the roof is then redistributed to the, all the other customers. Let me say it another way. Rich people put solar on the rooftop. Poor people pay for, because they can't afford to put solar on the rooftop, they pay for the cost that are reallocated to these customers. So I think the number one assignment on solar on the rooftop is get the pricing right and the allocation of the cost appropriately. And quite frankly, when someone has solar on the rooftop, you know, a cloud could pass over and then they need electricity. Or nighttime comes and they need electricity. So there ought to be some charge that's appropriately calculated to pay the utility for standing there with a distribution, transmission, and generation system ready to fill in when the solar isn't available. And we need to do that in a fair way. And it's mainly fairness among customers because the way they're doing it in California is 
The rich people put the solar on the rooftop, the poor people pay for the allocation of the cost. And that to me is just fundamentally unfair what they're doing in California. Yes. Hi. Um, so with the release of the uh, most recent IPCC report, uh, it's clear now more than ever what type of impacts humans are having on the climate. And yet in America especially, there are demographics that are resistant to um, the science despite the valiant efforts of you know, thousands of researchers. What uh, do you think the role of industry as a entity outside of academia, what's the role of industry in conveying the science and um, persuading those resistant to change? I think first and foremost, in industry, we don't know about science. And, and when you don't know about something, what do you do? You look to an expert to tell you. And so the IPCC has done their work. They basically say we have a major problem, that there, the emissions of CO2 by man are contributing to this, and that we need to, it could have very adverse impact um, on people around the world. Now, for me, the first, and I worked very hard in 2009 and led an effort and converted the people in my industry, because I was a ch chairman of our industry association at the time, to support the Waxman-Markey bill, which actually passed the House but didn't pass the Senate. So I tried to get legislation, because I'm a great believer that if you have a problem, you need to run to the problem and try to find a way to solve it in a way that works for both your customers as well as your investors. So we tried to embrace the problem and solve it. Couldn't get it done. And now the issue, uh, the evidence is even greater, but the issue is more toxic politically in terms of addressing it. So that is a major problem. Um, it's also a worldwide problem in, in the sense that the US is no longer number one emitter of CO2. China's moved into that position. Um, and as they change out their generation fleet over time, they're gonna address the issue. I have every confidence in everything. I've been to China a number of times and everything I read tells me that they're on a track of, they're gonna solve it. But you have to put in perspective what they did. They lifted 400 million people out of poverty by providing electricity to them as a first step in their economic development and their economic well-being. No other country in the history of the world has ever done that. And so now that they have become stronger financially and economically, now they can turn and do that. I think the important stat that I'll share with you in concluding is that when the political leaders won't act, then industry must act. And actually, the innovation around shale gas has had a dramatic impact on the emissions of our country. We're today, I mean, this year, I just read the statistic as a country, we're down about 3.8% over last year, uh, which is pretty interesting. I mean, our industry is, but that's because we use shale gas. But the better statistic is this. We today in the United States are back to the same level of carbon emissions as we were in 1992. And if you remember the Kyoto Protocol, you were supposed to bring your emissions level back to the 1990 level. So all those countries that signed that, only a few actually reached that goal, and we've come further than many of them because of this technological innovation that allowed us to, of course, we had the good fortune of having the shale gas a mile to two miles down below our surface. We have the good fortune of having a private property type country where people are motivated to sell their mineral rights, where the mineral rights aren't owned by the state. So, we developed it, but it's been not only cheaper energy for us, but, but it's put us in a much stronger place. I can say it another way, we bought almost 20 years of time. My fear is, is that people say, yeah, it's back to 1992 and we don't have to do anything now. I think we have to stay focused on doing things because I think money is to be made by finding ways to do things with a lower carbon footprint 
whether it's the generation of electricity, whether it's the driving your car, I think there is money to be made in the decarbonization of our society. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Chen Wen, and I'm from Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Science. So I have a question. Uh, I think that, well, um, maybe no energy source is perfect. And for example, when you have, uh, you try to promote the shell gas, but during the fracking process, for example, there may be some toxic water or maybe some methane leakage, which is a proto, uh, no, uh, greenhouse gases. So, uh, this suggests that we need to consider some other factors or maybe do a um, better assessment before we have the large scale implement implementation of this kind of you know energy sources so um, I'm curious like how Duke would you know uh, what kind of thought process Duke would take before they have the large-scale implementation of this alternative uh, energy sources no I Thank think you. those were two very question very good questions I mean first of all water is going to be the new oil of the 21st century because you look at the aquifers of the United States, they're lower at historic low levels. You look ar around the world, this is going to have a transformative impact uh, on our societies, just dealing with a shortage of water. And, and I see that coming. With respect to using water to do the drilling and what they, the companies are doing, they are giving providing transparency with respect to what chemicals they put in it. And the drilling, if this is the surface and the aquifers here, most of the drilling is down here. And so the probability that it will migrate into the aquifers, I think most scientists think that's a low probability given the nature of the geology of which the shale gas is found. Now, there are people that are looking at how you recycle that water uh, from the drilling. And so that's a partial solution, not complete. With respect to the methane, methane isn't released at every drilling, at every well. But I believe we can come up with a way to capture the methane, because it is much more powerful than normal CO2 that's emitted in terms of uh, impact on climate, as you suggested. So I think we need to find the technology to capture the methane from those wells where it's released, and it's not always released at every well. So I think those are the challenges that we have, and I think we have the capability to solve it um, going forward. We're out of time here and people of other classes to get to, but please join me in thanking Chairman Rogers for sharing his vision with us.